Hello, beautiful folk. <sighs> yeah, we're gonna. Ooh. I've just watched 20 minutes of Margot Simonian's unbelievable toxicity because a few members of the beautiful community who I'm gonna get back really badly for this asked me to. So she's released a 20 minute masterpiece which I've just watched and we're going to break it down to give us a flavor of something like where some of Russian propaganda is at and to give us a flavor also in Russian propaganda on Israel Gaza and to give ourselves maybe even a taster of a video that'll come soon on the main channel about special pathologies in Russian culture because one of the things that's so important to understand is that um the point that a lot of academics make against cultural essentialism is almost invariably pertinent, but there are occasions when what they say sounds as though you can't make cultural generalizations at all, um, and that is, of course, explanatorily absurd. Um, and that's why we'll do a video about big pathologies in Russian culture. Don't laugh too hard. Because you have big pathologies. You have big pathologies in, in your culture. We have big pathologies in our culture too. They're different, they're less toxic, but they are very, very damaging to us. Um, they blind us to the democratic risks we face, right? We can be a kind of democratic titanic because we don't understand what's happening to our democracies and how to protect them. For another time, that conversation. I'm going to give you a, a disinfected propositional overview of what Simonian comes up with there. And it's going to look a bit all over the place, but it's going to hit all the good hot spots. I, the reason it's toxic is because she's good. She is really good. If you think about how Trump is a master of exploiting vulnerability, in citizens. Margot Simonian is a master of exploiting mm, vulnerability and pathology um, in citizens. Anything toxic that's there, she'll be able to um, put it on a higher power. So she attacked um, Russia's greatest pop star of all time, Ala Pugacheva, who is still very much alive, for statements Pugacheva made um, 20 years ago um, about the theater hostage crisis in the Chechen war. And what's so powerful about that, as we'll see in a moment, is that it says nobody is clean when it comes to politics even the best people in our culture um mm, are yuck often politically and you know people listening to this feel if they're persuaded by what Simonian is saying which is just ridiculous and outrageous but that's separate um but if they believe what Simonian is saying that they, they, they think well there you go our greatest ever pop star um, who is still so powerful that the regime finds it hard to attack her um, she's in her 70s now um, even our greatest ever pop star who seemed to be so um, tidy so clean um, so committed to bringing people together um, even she has just you know, really ugly politics. You know, nobody escapes ugliness when they get into political opinions. Then she attacked um, another Russian dissident, um, a literary um, man and a commentator, Mr. Shonderovich, by picking on his partner, who apparently had lesbian relationships in the past, according to Simonian, and who um, on social media recently asked a Russian doctor why he was treating Russians, or maybe even why he was treating Russian soldiers, and shouldn't he be a doctor elsewhere, and blah, blah, blah. And um, Simonian said, uh, if you start talking about 
who doctors should treat on the basis of ethnicity, that's fascism. And if that isn't fascism, nothing is. So we're, we're good linking of sort of Russian um, dissidents to fascism, and we're not saying anything about that post. Shenderovich's partner wrote, I haven't seen it, in fact, that the content of it doesn't matter. Then she jumps, eventually she'll jump to Gaza, but um, then she jumps to a man in, a, in underpants that are a bit thong-like, walking around the streets of Odessa. And so she picked up the LGBTQ story here straight away and said, look what Ukrainians will uh, give in to if we don't conquer them. And then she said, look, we've got to take Odessa. She asked Putin recently, in fact, Simonyan asked Putin whether Russia should retake Odessa. And he said, this is not a territorial war. So we should neither retake uh, nor not retake Odessa. That's not the point. We don't think of this in terms of territory. But Margot Simonyan has kept going on about retaking um, Odessa. And... Uh, This remark raises a very important Russian pathology. Um, well, let me tell you straight away, in fact, what the three biggest cultural pathologies in Russia are. Um, number one, it's the thought that nobody is good as soon as they enter the public sphere. In private life, people can be good, but in politics, nobody is good. Everybody is kind of gray. You can't get out of gray, really. Perhaps there's black some places, but the rest is gray. There's no, there's no um, uh, decency. There's no purity. There's no normalcy in politics. Um, a, politics is an arena in which nobody is really good. And it's kind of, in fact, unethical to think that politics could be anything else. So nobody is good when it comes to politics and public life is one big kind of image um, that you are deeply caught up in in, in in Russian culture. So deeply that it almost feels like language, Russian language itself takes you in that direction. That's false. It doesn't. But um, typical usages of language about politics in Russian absolutely take you in that direction. You have to engage in an application of willpower to not start talking about politics in Russian as though it were a place where nobody is good. Right, That's one pathology. Another very deep pathology is a lack of boundaries, a profound lack of boundaries. Um, and it's rarely appropriate to connect a personal and a political flaw, a personal life and a public life flaw. But here, there are some grounds to do it. So there are, there are problems in Russian society with a lack of boundaries interpersonally. But then there are also huge problems with a lack of boundaries all round. And that is part of an imperialistic prejudice, in fact. Um, that, you know, um, well, they're not dealing very well with this man on the street in Odessa. Let's go capture Odessa. I mean, why not? Um, you know, the man next door can't operate his washing machine. I'll take the damn washing machine because if you could use it properly, he wouldn't be misusing it like that. I'm going to take it. Uh, excuse me, you, you haven't bought the washing machine. It's none of your business that your neighbor is misusing it. It is washing machine. He he can dance on top of it. I mean, he, he could he could play Lego on it. He doesn't uh, need to um, do with it what uh, you think he should. Normal people use washing machines properly. I mean, I'm gonna take it. Now that is of course insane, even in the context of Russian culture, but it feels a bit less insane than in our con context. Just to us, it just looks utterly um, sort of uh, transcendentally deranged. Um, yeah. 
A third pathology is this extraordinary incapacity to find anything good in one, uh, in one's own history, I mean, in one's culture, not in, not in one personally. Um, it's an extraordinary pathology. Um, and it also manifests in not being able to see an, a plural potential in different events. There's plenty of events in Russian history that indeed didn't go well, but could have gone a lot better than they did. And that could have is just unavailable. It's just unavailable. So that's the third pathology. And Margot here, and I'll do a main channel episode about these three pathologies because they're fascinating. But Margot here is beautifully uh, toxic. Um, at tapping into all of them. So this boundary story, you know, is what's driving the Odessa thong man comment. Now we move to Hamas. Very smart, unqualified condemnation of Hamas barbarism. She came, she came up with very, very effectively done. And immediately after she showed children in Gaza. And you, know, you can imagine what that what these images are like. And she pointed out the uh, conditions of the siege. And she called Israeli policy genocide. I'm not going to talk about what genocide is or isn't. I do not recommend you to label what Israel is doing in, in Gaza as, as genocide. They make a very brief remark about concepts like genocide or like ethnic cleansing. They are political concepts and therefore they need to be constructed. And there are two directions in which they can be constructed. The first direction says we've got to have them as narrow as possible because they serve a very special political interest which says there's a very special and unique category of evil, certainly that'll be true with genocide, and that's what that word should be used for. It shouldn't be used for a, a, an umbrella, right? But then there are other arguments which say, let's keep the term broad. But wh what I'm saying is that you cannot get out of this process of construction of that political concept. In other words, it's only if you construct genocide in a broad way and you have reasons for doing that, that you can point to the Genocide Convention as something to support your argument. You cannot just, this is what happens to me constantly when I mention genocide, people send me screenshots of the Genocide Convention, um, which is you know, something I think about less now, but I spent several years very deeply thinking about the um, post-World War II revolution. Um, in international norms and the human rights revolution um, and that it talks about it so this is this is obviously I'm not speaking in ignorance of what's written on these documents um, but you can't just do screenshots and send them to each other they precisely raise rather than settle the question right because um, to point to the genocide convention you need to argue for a broad definition of the term uh, a broad elaboration, a broad construction of the term. So political terms like genocide and indeed ethnic cleansing need to be constructed. They're not just given. They're not just given. And you construct them according to basic and urgent political need, basic political service they can be put to. Um, she says Israel's policies are barbarism in response to barbarism, and then she points... Um, to a, a, a Greek Orthodox church um, allegedly destroyed in Gaza um, and with a bit of a, this implication of Jews versus um, the Greek and Russian Orthodox tradition, right? so civilizational tension there. So what have we got so far? We've got a, a linkage of Israel with anti-Putin dissidents and the linkage of anti-Putin dissidents with fascism. And these remarks about Gaza in an extraordinary way tap into this nobody is good in politics pathology. It's a beautifully handled presentation by um, Simonian. Beautifully, beautifully toxic. Um, and 
it also feeds very well into this pathology of, mm, you know, we don't need to look for good things in a, in in our own past. Um, so the three central pathologies in Russian culture, this this woman is tapping into. Um, so it's a fantastic presentation. We shouldn't overestimate its influence. Properly to place this, you would need to look to Russian propaganda experts, um, of which I'm not one. I can do cultural commentary on it. Um, and then the only final remark I wanted to make about this is that um, this uh, bile is looking at the the ads that come in the middle of a video, which is littered with ads, is looks like it's spo sponsored, partly sponsored by the Moscow mayor's office. Um, and this is extraordinary sort of ju juxtaposition, which makes you feel like you're being gaslit between th this utterly dark, toxic manipulation that Simonian is doing. Because um, even if she's saying things that we could agree with or half agree with, of course, they're all designed for a purpose. Um, mm, you know, to cast in a certain light what the Putin regime is doing in Ukraine. Um, but then they're juxt juxtaposed with relatively normal sounding ads, um, w w which is quite a, w which is quite a, a combination. Um, how effective is this stuff? Mm, I'm afraid to say really good. I'm about seven and a half to eight out of ten on, on her um, um, despicable toxicity. Lots of toxin.